Okay, let's just bow our heads for a moment, friends, shall we? And I pray that my words will be in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, the end of the year. Beginning of another one. Um, I think I'm down to speak next week. Um, and there will be a more meaty message, hopefully, Lord willing, uh, concerning the new year next week, when the word revolution will be mentioned, because next week it's a New Year Revolution, is the title, as compared to New Year's Resolution. But today, um, I've mentioned the word revolution, as I promised I would, so let's consider this part one, and we can continue with that next week as part two, because actually, um, it's the same theme, basically, the start of a new beginning. Have you heard about the man who moved into a retirement community to spend the rest of his life there? And it wasn't long before he had made a number of friends amongst the other residents. And there was one lady he was especially attracted to, and she was attracted to him as well, and so they spent quite a lot of time together. And finally, one evening, he proposed, asking her to marry him. The next morning he woke up remembering his proposal, but he couldn't remember her answer. So he went to her and, went to her and said, uh, I'm, I'm really embarrassed. I, I proposed to you last night, but I can't remember whether you said yes or no. Oh, thank goodness for that, she said. I remembered saying yes, but I couldn't remember who asked me. <laughs> and sometimes we can feel a little bit... Um, about New Year's resolutions along those lines, can't we? We can tell ourselves the usual things, I'm going to turn over a new leaf, I'm going to exercise more regularly, I'm going to run, I'm going to walk, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to watch what I eat, the usual stuff, I'm going to do all kinds of things to improve myself physically and spiritually, and then somehow we forget. We take it to the something of January, we're perhaps we might struggle into February or something. Maybe you've got that problem as well, I don't know, but I've got a suggestion uh, for a New Year's resolution that we perhaps ought to remember. And it's kind of broad and very general, but here it is. It's, let's just promise ourselves and God that we will make a change for the better in 2019. As God's people, as his church, and uh, Brian alluded to that a uh, short, uh, short time back, and I'll mention it again in a minute, the church. Let's make this one simple resolution that we're going to make a change for the better. I know we've heard this, goodness knows how many times at the start of all the new years. But let's look along with it to be encouragers as well. Encouragers for each other, with each other. And to help us do that, let me suggest some ways in which we can make a change for the better and give out encouragement where we can. Because it's a tough old world out there, friends. Again, coming back to Brian, he's mentioned... Um, we're going to have stuff coming through soon. We're going to be back to all the political stuff. We're going to have this. We're going to have that. It's going to be conflicts. We all know it's going to happen. We need each other through the Lord. And it's good to be able to give encouragement where we can. In other words, come on, everyone. We're doing all right. We're on the right track. And we'll allude to that a little bit in a minute. How do you feel about your life? Is it worthwhile? What would you happen, have to happen to make you feel even more positive about your life? And for those who are listening on the internet to this message, it's as much for you, I don't know, maybe even more so than what it might be to the gathering that I'm looking at this morning. Because it applies to all of us. Maybe you might be saying to yourselves, what would happen, have to happen to make your life more positive? If you won the lottery, would that do it? If you got a promotion at work, would that do it? What would it take to, for you to really feel even more positive about your life? Now, if that's the way we're thinking, then we'll probably never feel really positive about life because all the little pieces that must come together to make us more positive will probably never be there. And that's the reason why I've selected Philippians. If you can turn to it if you like. It's only three verses. I'll read it. Philippians 3, verses 12 to 14 is our text this morning. But before I read it, um, let's just remember one thing. Paul, who wrote this, the Apostle Paul, is in prison at this time. He's chained to a Roman guard and he's under horrible 
conditions. He really is sort of suffering in a worldly way, if you like. Yet despite all that, he writes these wonderful positive words, and this is what he says. He says, not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect. You've got to read before this, of course, to understand what he's referring to. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already been made perfect. But I press on, he says, I press on to take hold of that of which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what was behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What is he reaching for? What's his goal? Well, of course, his goal is eternal life with Jesus. That is what he's reaching and striving for every day. His goal is heaven. Now, here's the point. If our goal is heaven, if our goal is eternal life with Jesus, then all these little setbacks in life are only stepping stones getting us closer to the time when we will be with Jesus. That's all they are. They're stepping stones. They might be rough stones, but we're going along and we're getting there. There's going to be disappointments in life, but every day that passes is one day closer to the time when we will be with Jesus. If that's our goal, then Romans 8.28, a very well-known verse, is true. All things, all things do work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. A very well-known verse. In fact, it's the, <laughs> the fourth most popular verse in the Bible to Bible Society members and supporters. There's a bit of information for you. But, I mean, there's the truth. The Bible is pure truth. But all things will work together for good for those of us who love God and are called according to his purpose. The world says that the way to feel good about yourself is climbing the ladder of success by making a lot of money, by having influential friends, by receiving a lot of awards, by belonging to the right circles. These are the things that make you all feel good about yourself. What a load of old washerwomans. Huh? The Bible teaches us that we ought to feel good about ourselves and others because God loves us. That's what it's about. You are such a treasured person in God's sight that he gave his only begotten son for you. And that makes us valuable and we can feel good about ourselves. And secondly, developing a positive attitude towards the church. I think we need to have a positive attitude towards the church. Oh, I don't think it, I know it. I don't say this in a self-serving way at all because one thing that is right about the church is our desire to simply lift up Jesus, to reach out to the lost and dying world with the message of salvation. Because, as, again, as Brian has alluded to earlier on, there's a little bit of a watering down of no, no, the message or whatever else a couple of days ago, I was talking to the minister of uh, a rather large church in Worcester, and he says that the trend is very much, not necessarily in his church particularly, the trend generally is that there's more activity in the church these days, but less paying attention to what the word is. And we need to be very careful as the church, bearing in mind the church is us, it's not just the building, we need to be very careful because we have a message of salvation, friends, we're not clever or, 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 or deserving or whatever else because we have this message, because the message can be given to anyone out there with any level of IQ or whatever else. We don't have to be incredibly gifted mentally or whatever else in this world. God actually says that he will confound the wise in some respects. But Jesus went to that cross for us. Now when you look at it plainly, you're either going to struggle along in this world within the life that we've got hoping that somebody somewhere will come up with something to put things right and all of a sudden it'll all work out, including all the politics and everything else, or you're going to put your faith and trust into something that you, probably, that you can't see but you've heard about, but when you hear what it is, how can you ignore it? The Lord Jesus came and hung on a cross for us and by his blood, by his blood shed, 
That sacrifice means we can have eternal life if we believe it and we go through God's rescue plan. We don't have to understand it. We don't have to be able to work it out. We just need to be able to accept that that's the way it is. And when we do that, all is fine when we love God in that way. If there's a 1% chance of that being right and a 99% chance of it being wrong, then for goodness sake, why not even consider the 1% when, you, when you're given that sort of promise? But as it happens, it is 100.0% absolute. And it's available to everybody. And again, if you're listening on the internet, don't just take my word for it. Look it up for yourselves and talk to those about God. It'll change your life. Yet, you know, coming back to the church, we hear people criticising the church, don't we? Folk will come along and say, oh, they're all judgmental. They're hypocritical. Well, yeah, okay. There are hypocrites in churches sometimes. None of us are perfect. But when you think about it, why take it out on God? Why turn around and say, oh, God, I have nothing to do with God. You should see some of the people are going to be so-called church. It's just unbelievably naive. Of course there are people in churches like that. But the church, yeah, and another thing they say is the church costs too much. It costs too much to do this and that and all the rest of it. We're always worrying about how much something costs, aren't we? <laughs> I was just thinking about it this very second. Our son hasn't got too much to worry about. He's just taken a job on, a full-time job at the Church of England, at a church um, in the black country. And he's been given two and a half million quid by the Archbishop of Canterbury to completely turn this church round altogether so um, but then I think he's um, in a better position than most to be able to do that but we're always worrying about how much something costs we need to leave it to God he will bring it through he will he will sort it out if that's the case you know in Matthew 26 there's an interesting account of something that happened as Jesus ate with his disciples and if you remember from Matthew 26, a woman bought a jar filled with expensive perfume and broke it and anointed his head with that perfume. And immediately some of the disciples started criticising the waste, saying that the perfume should have been sold and the money given to the poor. But Jesus defends her, saying, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing for me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. And actually Jesus carried on and he says, well, the poor you will always have with you. Which is actually a statement, when you stop and think about it, that's been true, hasn't it? There's always been poor people in terms of the earthly way of things. But he says, you won't always have me in the presence that uh, they had him at the time. You see, we have a different value system than the world. The world will consider something waste that we consider valuable. The world thinks you're wasting your time going to church. Sunday morning, yeah, it's the golf course, isn't it? Got to be, right? Church? What's the matter with you? Oh, come on, wake up. Get with it. You know, get streetwise. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. When we give away 10% or 15% or 20% of our income to build the kingdom of God, they would call that a waste as well. But the things the world calls waste are probably the only things that will last for all, all eternity. Remember that woman who poured the perfume on Jesus says, well he said, I tell you the truth, whenever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And it's in the scriptures. And it will have been quoted, I don't know how many thousands or millions of times, up and down churches and lands, everywhere the last 2,000 years, so that's true enough. We need to understand, of course, that when we risk something for God, we could lose, as it were, but we have won a big battle already because, as we've already said, Jesus went to the cross and died for us. Okay, we might lose some skirmishes along the way because, yes, yeah, Satan is still the prince of this world and there are a lot of things going on that are not God's will. But I'll tell you something, friends, I would rather be trying something great for God and fail than play it safe and succeed. We need to display a positive and encouraging attitude for others. Let's call it a revolution in 2019. It's a hard world. I know I'm 
really sort of pumping this out a bit. But it's a hard world. It's a world that doesn't always exercise courtesy. Sometimes it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You know, people are jockeying for positions on motorways in their cars and in their companies and they're filled with all kinds of stress and anxiety. But the church, you know, we need to be a place where we can all come and be accepted and loved and encouraged to build, to build ourselves up. A place where there are people there to help us carry our burdens and everyone feels welcome. Because if we treat each other with love and then wonderful things are going to happen for the kingdom. So in this new year, let us be sure that we're going to be stay, displaying a positive attitude towards others. A brief story, and I'm only going to make it brief, of, of a guy called Robert Manry and his wife, and this fellow, the year's 1965, and it's, it's told that he, he was getting ready to make a transatlantic voyage in his homemade boat um, from Falmouth in Massachusetts to Falmouth in England. And without exception, everyone on this pier was, to was vocally pessimistic. Everyone was telling him that he was ridiculous, that everything uh, was going to go wrong, the sun's going to broil you, you won't have enough food, that boat of yours isn't going to stand any of the storms, you'll never make it. Everyone, apart from one person, his wife, was getting on to him. And she heard all these discouraging words and she decided to offer some words of encouragement. And as he set off this little boat, pulling away from the shore, she went to the end of the pier and began waving both arms and shouted, oh, you're really something, I'm with you, I'm proud of you, you're going to make it, she said to him. And on June the 1st, 1965, this 13 and a half foot boat slipped away. He was the smallest boat ever to make the trip and this guy Robert Mannery had been a copy editor for a local newspaper and he's just something he wanted to do. But he wasn't afraid of the ocean. So he didn't uh, tell many people about what he was going to do, just a few relatives and his wife who was his greatest supporter. And the trip was anything but pleasant. He spent many sleepless nights trying to cross the shipping lanes without getting run down and sunk. Weeks at sea caused his food to become tasteless. Loneliness caused him to have hallucinations. His rudder broke three times. Storms swept him overboard. And hadn't it been for the rope that he got tied around his waist, he would never have made it back to the ship to the boat. And finally, after 78 days alone, he sailed into England on August the 17th, 1965, thinking, well, there won't be anybody who will know about this. You know, I'll probably just go and have a bit of a meal somewhere and all the rest of it. But, to his amazement, 300 vessels with horns blasting escorted him into the port at Falmouth. The TV were there, 40,000 people stood screaming and cheering him, and there was his wife, the one person for whom had given him the encouragement to go out there and do it, and he made it. And we need a word of encouragement. He just remembered her standing on the pier, shouting encouragement. That 30 seconds, or whatever it may have been, got me through. It's amazing, friends, when we give encouragement to somebody, it lifts, and it doesn't just make them feel good for a few moments, it can make them feel, wow, yeah, this is fine, thank you very much. That's something we can do for 2019. We need a word of encouragement, and that's what the world needs. You know, when people are inducted into fame, um, in fact, just thinking about it, it was about a couple of days ago, wasn't it, that um, all of these um, MBEs and OBEs were given and knighthoods for sport and all the rest of it. And it's amazing how, how many folk turn around and say, yes, but it was the people around me who deserve this as much as I do. I'm taking it for them. I noticed on, on a number of occasions, certainly um, Alistair Cook of cricket fame was saying that very much so, and I'm sure, I think others were too. The other would mean nothing to me, they often say, if I didn't have people like that around me, encourage me and love me. And it makes such a difference. People need, need people. Someone wrote a song about that. I can't think who it was. But more than that, people need positive people, constant positive influence in life. Maybe that more than any other ought to be our New Year's Reva, Reza. <laughs> Enid smiling. <laughs> Lucian. A change for the better. I'm going to be positive as I look at my life, let's say. I'm going to be positive as I look at the church. I'm going to be positive as I look at others. And I'm going to encourage others in 2019. We're going to turn our TVs on, some of us, and hear the news and the politics. And think, oh, 
okay, let's, let's, let, let's listen to what's going on. But we need, don't we, somebody, something to come back to, to keep us going. May I suggest to all of us that this resolution filters down to every segment of our lives in 2019. So it's going to be one of the best years that we've ever had. And as we live each day of it, we'll get closer and closer to the goal, the heavenward prize, to be with Jesus. We're a year closer to heaven, friends, than what we were this time last year. A bit of an obvious statement, that. Everything is on course. Let's remember that. Everything's on course. We need to trust the Lord and love him, and when we do, everything is on course. We need to place our hands, our lives in his hands and allow him to use us to his glory. When we do, everything is on course. Let's remember God wants to, to use us in grander ways than we've ever dreamt of, if we're willing to be used. And when we're encouraging others, God is using us for that. He is. Again, the Apostle Paul was continually looking at the big picture. He said to the church in Corinth, Do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. And yep, those of us who get older know it some degree or other, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and, our, our, and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix on our, our eyes on what is not, on what is, on what is, start again, we'll fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Think about that. What we see is temporary. What we don't see is eternal. Because eternally, there's a lot that we don't see. But we know and we trust and we believe that it is God's way for us, bringing us through. Just going to finish now again with the Apostle Paul talking to the church in Ephesus. You might have heard me mentioning this when I've led services and used it as a doxology. Ephesians 3.20 is a promise. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So as we travel through the new year, we can count on challenging interruptions and ad ad adversities. But through faith in Jesus, let's turn every interruption and adversity into opportunities. And next week, I'll bring another New Year message, which really is a revolution turning round. <laughs>